Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Vote podcast. This is 139 with Jeff Maines. He is the founder and CEO of Champion Leadership Group, a growth accelerator which helps businesses grow from 1 million per year to 10 million per year, which is the topic for today. He is also the founder and CEO of Intelligent Contacts, a SaaS platform that helps hospitals make their billing as great as their bedside manner. Before these two businesses, he previously started and sold four additional businesses that were each grossing over $10 million annually uh, when he sold them. And he's also the host of SaaS Fuel, a podcast that started almost a year ago that seeks to help founders spark creative thinking on their wild journey of entrepreneurship. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Jeff. I appreciate it. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about... Uh, your journey to getting started with entrepreneurship, and then we'll go into the topic of how to grow companies. Thanks, Sean. It is great to be here and uh, talk about building. And that's the, really the topic of the podcast is, you know, how do you scale a company? Yeah, a lot of my journey and background has been entrepreneurial. Yeah, I don't really know how to be an employee. And so it's one of the things that I probably learned pretty early on and uh, just had a real talent for finding ways to, to make money. And so whether that was, you know, starting, you know, a business as a teenager and, you know, being my own boss, hiring people to, uh, to do fulfillment, uh, you know, all the way through starting multiple companies. And so it's been a really interesting journey uh, overall. It's far different than what I expected it to be. You know, the entrepreneurial journey is, uh, you know, it's been described as running from one crisis to another with enthusiasm. And I think that really describes my journey in a lot of ways. You know, it's, it's, they always have a lot of ups and downs. It's never always up and to the right. You know, of course, that's what you'd read in the magazines. That's, that's what it is. You just, you know, roll out of bed, start a company and make a bunch of money. But it's, it's been very different than that. A lot of ups and downs, a lot of mistakes along the way, uh, but a lot of great moments and successes and the ability to, to give back. Uh, to the the SaaS community, to give back to other business leaders, and to you know support nonprofits is I think one of the greatest benefits of uh, being able to do that. The thing that's most prescient in my mind is you're on your fifth and sixth companies. One of them is already over ten million. One of them is on its way to ten million. Is there a secret recipe for getting to ten million per year or more that you need to know before you start a company. Is there a certain kind of company that that you know gets there, or you know, how did you like come up with the idea on the fly and then said, "I'm going to figure out how to make it do 10 million," or you know, like how does that work? Because I know a lot of companies that they're never going to get there. Maybe it's the business is the problem, the model is the problem, or maybe it's the founder that's the problem, or maybe it's both. I don't know. It can certainly be all of those or any combination of those. But, uh, you know, if you're looking to build a company, I never really started out thinking, you know, I'm going to get this to, to 10. It, it's always, you know, what do I need to get to the next, you know, to start it out? What do I need to do to get to one? And then what do I need to do to get to two and three and five and seven and 10 and 20 and beyond? So it's really thinking about doing things for the right next step. And I think that can be one of the big challenges is, you know, reading a tactic or reading a book or hearing somebody talk about you know, something that worked for them and thinking, hey, you know, I can try that and it'll work in my business and they try it and it doesn't work. I think, well, well, you know, that was a bad idea. And it's not necessarily that it was a bad idea, but timing matters. You know, if you're going to bake a cake and there's, there's a recipe that you're following, there are steps that you have to follow and you have to do things in order. Uh, you can't, you know, put it in the oven and then decide I'm going to add the ingredients later on. So there, the process matters. And I think the same thing is true in business. If you're going to grow a company, that the process matters and the order of operations makes a difference. So I think that's you know one of the things that that I've learned along the way is is doing things in the right order. And you know how does a company get to to ten or beyond? I think it really starts with the problem that you solve, and being very clear about what that problem is, making sure it's a problem big enough to warrant a solution. Is there lots of lots of great things out there and people solve problems that you know, nobody really cares about except for, I mean, maybe they do a little bit. You know, is it a problem that needs to be solved? Is it something that someone would pay for? Is it a nice to have, or is it a real need 
Like people really need this and are willing to pay lots and lots of money uh, to solve that problem. So I think that's a really good place to start in, in looking for that product market fit is, uh, is with the problem that you solve. You haven't raised a single dollar from outside investors before for any of these businesses, am I right? I, I funded companies lots of different ways. Bootstrapped is by far my favorite, and the, the last couple have been that way and, and you know, will be going forward uh, just because it really gives you ultimate freedom. And so I've done it the other way where I've had investors, I've done debt financing, I've done a number of different ways uh, of, of company funding. But really being the, you know, the master of my own destiny is, is something that is important. And, and building a company, not to make a quarterly number or to make an investor happy, but really being able to make the choice and have the freedom to make the choice um, that's right for the company and for the employees and for the clients long term. And so for me, that's just kind of a, a core value and, and a line in the sand that I drew that you know, I'm not going to take outside financing if I lose that kind of control. I think that's smart. I've talked to uh, many people that have the same philosophy as you, and, and I like that philosophy quite a lot. Um, so basically, what I to go back to the question I was thinking of before, I've heard investors say, or I've heard other founders say, if you want to make $100 million, you got to solve a billion dollar problem. Something like this. If you want to make $10 billion, you got to solve a $100 billion problem, right? Do you think there's any merit to that, uh, especially on a bootstrap to profit model where your goal isn't to become a multi-billion dollar company, but something that you're happy doing 10 million a year with? I do. You know, I think the, the level of problem that you, you solve has to be big enough to, to warrant people wanting to pay for it. And so whether it's bootstrapped and, and you can bootstrap, there have been companies that have been bootstrapped to a hundred million or, you know, multi-billion dollars. There's lots of different ways to, to fund companies rather than just taking outside investment. So it, it's certainly possible to do that. So it's not that, that you can't build a hundred million dollar company or you know, a billion dollar company. Um, the biggest company I built was uh, 137 million. And, and again, that was with an SBA loan that was not with any outside investment. So it, it can be done for sure. You said that process is important. Is there a specific process that is repeatable across businesses, no matter what industry they're in, in order to scale to $10 million a year? There is. And, you know, there's no magic formula. Uh, I can tell you that. But I think that you do this enough times and you start seeing patterns. And one of the patterns that I recognized pretty early on was uh, letting go and you know, hiring good people to take on areas where, you know, my expertise was weak. And it's honestly, that's a lot of areas. But it, it's understanding what those are, you know, there are things that I'm really, really good at. And there are a lot of things that I'm not very good at at all. And there are things that I can do. But they don't bring me joy. I'm not great at them. Uh, but I can get them done. And so that's, it's really difficult as an entrepreneur, because it's really easy for us to think that we're fantastic at everything. And you know, we can do everything. And even those things that we can do, it's sometimes really hard to let go of those and let somebody else who that is their genius take that and run with it. So I think that's one of the, the first lessons that, uh, that I learned and, and moved from one company to another was delegation and really hiring a team that has that expertise that complements. They have strengths where I'm weak and maybe they have weaknesses where I'm strong, but together we really form a powerhouse combination. When you can build a leadership team, uh, an executive team like that, you really become unstoppable as a business. But it's difficult to do as a founder. How long did it take for you to iron out in your mind what it is that you're good at and what you're not good at so that you could hire for those positions? You know, I, I don't know that I've completely ironed that out because there are a lot of things that I think I'm good at. And then I meet somebody who is fantastic at and I go, well, you know, I'm not that great. So it's, it's really easy to think that we're, we're really good at things in isolation. You know, if, if you're on a, you know, a team, like say a sports team, if you're on a sports team of, of 10 people, it's not real hard to be a superstar. But then let's say you go up to a team. Now you've got a hundred people and you think about, you know, like, you know, peewee league to, to junior high, to high school, to college, to pro. And the, the more you go up in those ranks and the more you're around people that have, you know, big, big talent, you kind of realize, you know, maybe I'm not as talented as I thought I was in that area. So I think it's, it's a constant struggle 
we don't always see our blind spots. It's why they're blind spots. It's why we need other people. And so, you know, I still think that I'm on that journey of learning, you know, what I don't know. And, you know, even areas I think that I'm strong in, you know, I'm continuing to develop in, in areas. So, you know, I certainly don't have all this figured out, you know, even now. And, and I hope that, that I never do. I hope 50 years from now, I look back and go, wow, what I was doing back then was, was completely Mickey Mouse stuff. And so, you know, it's just, there's so much more to learn, but being around that, that talent level, the more the talent level goes up, the, the more, you know, I see places that I can hand off. And people do really, really well in things that I thought were pretty good at the time. I don't want to say that I have figured it out either. But from the few companies that I've worked on, I've gotten a pretty good sense of what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. And I learned with my tech company what I was really not good at. Um, but I had no choice but to learn how to do, which was UI, UX design, um, you know, road mapping for product and, and these kinds of things, uh, documentation for feature specifications. Wow, I learned a crap ton doing that. Um, I I thought I was good. And then I, I started to have a team and they're like, no, this is absolutely horrific. You need to do it over again. And and then I would, I would do it again. I would get a little bit better at it. And then eventually my CEO was like, please, for the love of God, let me hire a product manager. And I was like, okay, fine, fine, fine. And then I saw what she was doing and I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. Um, I think what I'm best at is coming up with revenue streams, ideas, and then going out and talking to people, finding out from them what they like, what they don't like, what they want, and how to get them to pay for it, basically. Um, and I think that makes me like pretty well suited for being a CEO. It's like, I love to network. I love to talk with people and I love to get in their heads and learn from them. Um, and so I thought with my tech company, I'd be involved heavily in the marketing and the sales and the customer service and the product. But as I alluded to my COO was like, yeah, but you can't do that stuff. It's like, you think you're good at it and you might be actually quite good at it, but like, you've got to find one thing and you've got to focus on that thing and you've got to let everyone else do the rest. And even though we weren't at a point where we could have people doing all of those positions. Um, but I, I like to think I learned quite a lot. And so now I try to focus a lot more on the, the sales um, pipeline and, and the lead gen and, um, you know, the networking, finding the potential customers, talking to them and, and, you know, this kind of stuff. So, but I'm still excited because I know there's a lot more to learn. So I'm curious from your side, what do you think you're best at? and that you like to do? And what is it that you know that you're good at, but you don't like to do? I think sales and relationships, those are, are two things that I've been very good at over the years and being able to build relationships. And I think that's, that's what makes sales fun. That's what makes sales effective is building relationships. It's not, not about having conversations with somebody just because you want something, but being genuinely interested in, in who they are and what they're doing and, and how, how we can, solve a problem for them or make their life better in some way. So I think that's, that's part of it. Uh, I'd also say, you know, team leadership, uh, casting vision, uh, just being able to, to inspire people, motivate people. Uh, sometimes it's almost scary how much loyalty there is in that, the company. And so it's, it's, it's a tremendous gift. And so I have to be very careful with that gift. I mean, that, that's the way I look at it is because they're giving me that gift of trust. And so it's, it's being very careful with that gift and making sure that I'm leading them in the, the right direction. You know, if they want to overcommit or they want to, you know, loyalty is, I, I think, a, it sometimes can be a scary thing where they're just completely committed and sold out to the, the company or to the, the purpose or, or to our clients. And, and I think that's incredibly admirable. So it's, it's really important for me to make sure that I'm leading them well and leading them in the other right direction. That's where you get these kinds of guys like Steve Jobs who create these cults of personality where you have this incredible loyalty even when sometimes it's maybe not really deserved because of the way they treat people. Don't know him personally, never had the opportunity to meet him, but uh, there are definitely some stories out there, um, you know, both, both good and bad, about uh, leadership style. What's something that you've had to change about yourself through the process of starting all of these companies. A big one is just 
becoming more outgoing. I mean, a lot of people think I'm an extrovert and, uh, and I'm really not at all, which is, is funny because from the outside, you're like, well, you do all this stuff. And I'm really an introvert who does extroverted things. And, and I really enjoy that. But I, I get recharged by, you know, withdrawing, be, you know, alone time, quiet, you know, that's put me in a, a party. And I'm like, not, not to, you know, the, the greatest environment, you know, I'd rather be home doing nothing. I don't know that I ever do nothing, but, you know, but it's one of those things that people would be really surprised at that. And uh, it's particularly, how does that square with sales? You know, how can you possibly be good at sales and be an introvert? And I think it's it's the curiosity, it's the relationships, it's spending time with with people, uh, but not necessarily you know big groups being the dancing bear, although that's you know, what I end up doing sometimes. I feel we're very similar in that regard, because like I may spend a few hours a day talking to different people, whether it's for business or family, friends, whatever. I'm like I spend hours a day talking to people. And the only way that I have the energy to do that is if I also spend a few hours a day just by myself going for walks, uh, meditating at the gym with, you know, music on or a podcast just like by myself. I think we have to or else we'll burn out from just giving away too much of ourselves. That's important to have that to, to really know yourself and have that time to recharge, to re rebuild, regenerate. How do you come up with an idea for another business? It's been different every time. Sometimes it's a, a problem that I'm having or experiencing. Sometimes it's a problem that I see in the marketplace. Uh, a company prior to this was really something that, um, I guess two companies ago, uh, as another SaaS company before this, prior to that was a mortgage outsourcing company. And so it was really a problem that I saw uh, that I was experiencing myself and, and it was that loans couldn't be closed fast enough. And so started a company specifically for that, uh, partnered up with somebody who was in that space and knew it really well and had, he was in the sales and had big frustrations because he wasn't getting loans closed either. And he wasn't getting paid because they couldn't close them fast enough. And I'm, you know, I was buying properties and I couldn't buy them fast enough. I couldn't get deals done. And so really started the company specifically for that. Uh, to solve a problem. Um, I've also, you know, in this example with Intelligent Contacts, really saw an opportunity in the marketplace. So it wasn't a, a problem that I was experiencing, but then the prior SaaS company was a, a CRM type product. And so a lot of the partners that we are working with um, do some of the pieces that we do today in communications and payments. And nobody was doing it online. Everything was an on-premise solution. And so I saw there's a real opportunity to take that the next level and, uh, and, and build a SaaS around uh, communications, unified communications and payments and unite those two things together. And originally started doing the, the concept around the, the CRM, but it made a lot, more ex a lot more sense instead of just building it to go with that, to exit that company and, and build it independently so then we could work with any CRM. And, and that just kind of led into to healthcare. So how can we use the, the technology that we've got for communication and payments to help hospitals, health system, physician practices, labs, fix that the billing process that was extremely broken. And so again, it kind of led back to a problem that it was, was very familiar to me with, uh, with family members and uh, healthcare issues and things like that and dealing with uh, a really broken billing system. And so how can we take that and use that to, to fix a problem in the marketplace? So I think it's gonna come full circle. After an idea comes to you, what do you do before you decide whether to pursue it or not? Looking at the, the marketplace, you know, are there competitors? Is there a solution out there that really fits something? Is there something that, you know, what are the alternatives? And kind of looking at that, because I don't want to just be another me too. You know, what can we do? What can I build? What can I, how can I fit into the marketplace and be different? So I think that's one of the big ones is looking for, you know, what is the opportunity? How is it different? How would it be differentiated? You know, is there something that's pretty close? Is this just uh, another, uh, another me too solution? Um, and is it really going to solve a problem? Is it something that is needed in the marketplace? So I have lots of ideas that, uh, yeah, sometimes I think they're great ideas and you start talking to the target market and you find out that, yeah, it may be a little bit of, uh, it may be a little bit painful for them, but it's, it's not something that they're just 
you know, desperate to solve. And I think that's, that's where entrepreneurs will get tripped up is they'll see something, they'll see a problem in the marketplace and it may be a problem, but not all problems are painful. And if it's not a painful problem, nobody's going to pay to solve it. We deal with problems all the time. There are lots of problems you know, that, that you have, that I have, that, that everybody listening has, and we just live with them because it's, it's not painful. It's really not that big a deal. Maybe it's a minor inconvenience, but you know, we're not going to pay to solve it. It just, it is what it is until some solution comes along or uh, until it becomes painful. And so that happens too. So you have problems that are not a big deal and then it becomes painful and now I've got to find a solution. So, you know, is there some sort of a trigger event where one of those problems becomes painful enough for somebody to go out and look for a solution? And if so, is that on a wide, wide enough scale to build a business? If you're looking to know the secrets of how to go from 1 million to 10 million, I promise you we're getting there soon. So there's just a little bit more that I want to ask that will get us there. Once you've determined that an idea is worth pursuing and turning into a business, on average, how quickly do you get that first dollar of revenue in from your experience? I think it's really important to get to that point, to get to revenue really fast because revenue is what validates the idea. If you're building something for, you know, one, two, three, five years, um, you're basically, you're creating a museum for one. But it's, it's because good ideas are a dime a dozen. Uh, it's, it's the implementation and the execution of those ideas and getting somebody to pay for it. Even doing surveys or doing market surveys you know, and, and asking people, you know, is this a solution that you would pay for? Here's a prototype. Uh, you know, would you buy this? It depends on who you ask. A lot of times you'll get, yeah, I would. Uh, until you say, okay, you know, sign up, you know, sign here. Well, you know, I, I really don't want to do that. So I think the revenue is the validation of the idea. And so the sooner you can get to revenue, uh, even, even doing something that uh, you know, we actually teach this in the, the accelerator, how you can build and have clients fund uh, your solution. And so I think that's a really interesting concept. Be, have your, your prospects actually pre-buy something that doesn't exist yet because they're going to get it and you're going to build it. So, you know, validating and how quickly can you get to revenue, I think, is one of the ways that you validate the idea. So the sooner you can do that, maybe it's month one. Um, I wouldn't go more than probably six months without uh, seeing that revenue come in the door. For your businesses so far, what have you seen the average time to first dollar in? A lot of times it is within the first few months. First two to three months, we've, we've got, you know, paying customers and, and they're live, they're, they're using something. And so maybe it is a, an alpha version, a beta version, something that's very early, you know, minimum, we, we hear about minimum viable product and, and that's cool and all. Um, but, uh, you know, a friend of mine, Jim Kane came up with an even better uh, term and it's minimum sellable product, you know, so what is it that you can sell and, and do that very quickly? So is there a, an absolute minimum feature set that you can deliver in a very short period of time to start generating some revenue, uh, to get that flywheel going? And so you can continue to enhance the product. So once you have the first dollar in, how do you take it to a, uh, a million dollars? And from your business's experience, how often does it take to get to a million dollars uh, annual revenue? It depends on the industry. Uh, I've done it as fast as uh, a few months and uh, taken as long as a couple of years. So it kind of depends on the, the industry and, and what you're selling. And price point, I think, plays a, a very big role in that. So if you're talking about how do you get to a million dollars in revenue, well, you could sell you know, a million things at a dollar, and, and that may be really slow. It could be really fast. You could sell a thousand things at, at $83 a month. Uh, you could sell, I have to figure out that, the math, I think that's right. Uh, you could sell one thing at a million dollars. So, you know, what is it that, that your pricing model is? How quickly can you get to a million? Well, if it takes, you know, if you're selling one thing at a million dollars and it takes you six months to sell, to sell one, well, now, you know, you're there in six months and maybe 12 months, now you're at two. Where if you're trying to sell a million things at a dollar, it, it may be a very slow process or it could be super fast. I mean, is it a pet rock? I don't know. 
So I think you know the product makes a difference in your market, and just the the speed of the transaction, the speed of of uh, the sales cycle, and so how quickly can you get the the sales cycle moving forward? What does that look like? And making sure that the dollar amount is you know warrants that. So what does it cost you to get a sale? You know, if it costs you five dollars to get that that sale that you're you're selling you know a million things for a dollar then uh, you know, you're going to be upside down by $4 million by the time you get to a million. So making sure that the economics are correct on that, the front end is really, really important. There are a number of businesses that for some reason or another are able to reach a million dollars in a single year. And a lot of them fall apart after that and they never recover. So assuming our mythical company reaches a million dollars in a single year, what should they be thinking about to make sure that even if they don't grow that next year, let's assume they've, they've done a million dollars by the end of 365 days from the day they start, right? What should they be thinking about in order to make sure that even if they don't grow, they also don't shrink in that second year? Margin. Uh, fundamentals matter. And so building a business that makes money. You know, I think particularly in the, the SaaS space, um, and, and kind of business in, in general, somehow the idea has come along that uh, it's okay to lose money for infinity, uh, at least for a while. And, and we'll make that up because we're going to get market share. We're going to do volume. Uh, but fundamentals matter. You know, it, building a profitable business model from the beginning, I think that's one of the reasons that uh, you know, I love bootstrappers so much is, is they, they have it figured out. And so it's not just trying to buy market share or it is, uh, you know, it's not building a bad business or, you know, you're, you're doing it with a whole lot of capital, but you're running in a capital efficient way. You're doing it profitably. You have a model that is sustainable over time. So I think, you know, how do you get, you know, how do you keep it, you know, at one and, and get to two or keep it at one and not go backwards? I think is fundamentally build a model that has you know, margin and profit built into it. What separates a company from remaining stagnant at that one million and one that can get to the next level, let's say two million? There are really three transition points on the way to 10 million in revenue. Uh, one will come sometime between one and two million. There's another one, uh, three to five. A lot of companies will get stuck right there at the four to five million dollar range. And then another one kind of seven or eight trying to, to get to 10. And one to two, one of the, the key things is, is team. So growing beyond the founder, a lot of times at a, at a million, the bottleneck is the founder. And, uh, and that, that's not a popular thing to say necessarily, but it's, it's true. But it, it's about the founder bringing in other people that have the expertise. It's about letting go of things and not holding on so tight. And that's a, that's a really hard lesson to learn. Uh, particularly early on, you know, first couple of startups, and even now, and every time uh, a company, you know, these are lessons that I know, and and I absolutely know in my heart that this is the right thing to do and let it go, but it doesn't mean that it's easy, because you know I've done all this work, I got to a million, and it's my baby, and so you know it's taking that, you know, you're handing off something that uh, is is a big big trust, big responsibility to somebody else, and so to see them take off and and go is fantastic, but it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you make a mishire. You bring somebody in, they let you down. That makes it that much more difficult uh, because you've been burned to, to let that go again. You know, I hired a salesperson and they were terrible. And so I can't ever hire salespeople again. I'm the only one that can do that. Well, the company is never gonna scale if it's being held back by one person. So it's, you know, how do you eliminate those bottlenecks and how do you find the right people and get them in the right places to help carry the load? So that's what starts to get a company from one to two. Yes. Yes. Is there a specific example in which you had an issue letting go that caused your business? It, it took longer to grow because of that? I think that always happens. You know, every, every single time, like I said, it, it's hard to do. And even when I know that, that it's time, it's still hard to let go. And so it, it's really finding the, the person. And there have been times where I've hired, I have hired the wrong person. Uh, I've hired the wrong person and uh, and have lost millions, and and that makes it just that much more difficult and, and painful to to try again. But I know that that's the path to success is finding somebody that that really has that genius that can take a, an area of the business and and just blow it up. What specifically has been your most costly ex mistake to date? And if you could put a number on that. That would be interesting. 
I actually brought somebody in in an area of the business, particularly in, in this company in payments, uh, that uh, I really had no experience in that and was looking for somebody that did. And, uh, and they were supposed to be a, an expert. And just the, the way that the, the, the system works, I mean, they, they did really well from the, the revenue side um, temporarily. And, uh, and it went up and up, and you know, things looked like they were going really, really well. And, uh, and then things kind of fell apart uh, fairly suddenly. And uh, so there was some, some fraud and some other things going on, but we ended up uh, upside down $5 million. So, you know, you, you think starting at zero is hard. Now try restarting at minus five. And now you've got to build back up uh, past that and, uh, and, you know, do it all over again. So that's a, it's a costly mistake in, in hiring the, the wrong people. And there were, there were definitely signs there uh, beforehand. But, you know, it, it's hard to admit it, mistakes. So as a leader, I think that's something that we've got to be good at is uh, admitting our mistakes and, and cutting our losses earlier. So that's another thing that's really difficult of, uh, you know, when we make a mistake, admit it, cut the loss and, and make a right choice. But sometimes we want to hold on to those wrong choices for a long time because it just it feels good. We don't want to say it was a bad choice, even though. Yeah, you know, anybody from the outside looking at it would go, that was really dumb. Yeah, I've made those kinds of mistakes before. Never worth $5 million, thankfully, but um, still painful nonetheless. So let's say we've gotten our company to $2 million. We've started to think about team process, uh, you know, economic economics per unit. What do we need to then change to go from two to, let's say, four? Two to four, the team is going to start growing. And so one of the first things that's going to be strained is process. And so getting, getting knowledge transferred over to new team members. And so having a structured process, getting knowledge out of people's heads and into documentation, into you know, a formal process. And... You know, it's one of those things that I think is, is really difficult a lot of times as founders because we want the, the culture to be fun. We want it to be free. We don't want all those constraints of the, the corporate world, right? And so you, know, you think, well, process, well, that, that's not going to be any fun. We're going we're gonna to take the life out of the company. But it's actually the opposite. You're really giving life to the company and allowing it to breathe and allowing new, new people to come in. You think about uh, you know, a body and, and cell division. So, you know, you have two cells and now, or you have one cell and it that splits into two and two into four and, and, and goes on. And I think growing a company is, is very similar to that. But you want that DNA to be passed on within the organization so that you keep the, the structured processes, you keep the things that, that made, made you successful and, you know, take that to the, the next generation. But it doesn't stop there. Once processes are in place, that's the starting point. It's not the ending point. You think, hey, I just created these processes. Now, why are we going and revisiting them? But as the company continues to grow, those will expand. Those, as you bring in new talent, you bring in people who, who know more, that have more expertise, they're able to take that to the next iteration, the next iteration, the next iteration. And I think that's a really important thing to, to keep. You don't want to be stagnant. Um, we do want those processes in place. You want a way to, to do things. You have you know, your way, but it's not something that is your way forever. It's something that, that does change over time. So at that size revenue, would if you were hiring someone, would you expect all of the processes and documentation for that position to be mapped out and ready for them to walk into? Or would you expect it not to be great and hope that they kind of like fix it in the beginning of their job, like their time working with you? I don't think they, they all have to be uh, completely mapped out, but one of the worst things you can do is hire somebody into an, a, a new position that doesn't even exist yet, kind of throw them into it and say, welcome, go figure it out. And that happens all the time. I've done it uh, probably way too many times. And uh, for everybody I've done that too, I apologize. Here we go, public apology. Uh, no, having, you know, making sure that, that somebody is doing that role uh, because somebody is, is doing some sort of function in that role. It may not be great, but having some sort of documentation, some sort of here's how we do it today. 
and it, you know, giving them the expectation, giving them the freedom to make it better. But I think it is important, at least having some sort of a framework that they can walk into, uh, some context instead of just, you know, hey, here's a new role. Nobody's ever done this before. I hope you figure it out. That's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, I think I've pissed off a number of my employees. <laughs> it was never my goal. But as I said, when I first started out, I didn't know anything about tech. And so, you know, like my first hire was the lead engineer who was responsible for the architecting of the, the infrastructure of the back end. And he was like, okay, well, make me some, you know, wireframes and tell me what everything does. And I didn't know what I was doing. So we wasted months because I created this massive thing that I thought was amazing. And he was like, this is trash. Do it again. I was like, I just spent like three months making this for you. He's like, it's trash. Do it again. <laughs> yeah, that's where collaboration is certainly helpful. Well, the thing is, it was my vision and he didn't understand what I wanted to build until I gave him more information. So it was completely on me. There was literally just me and him. There was nobody else. So he, he was like, I can build anything you want as long as I know what it is that you want. And if you don't know how to tell me what you want, I can't build it for you. And I was like, you make a lot of sense, but I've never done this before. So I need you to teach me how to do it so I can do it for you. And, and so it, it took like five or six months before we finally had something that we could work with. And even then, when we went to go hire the product manager, everything was still a freaking mess because the documentation didn't match the designs sometimes, right? So we would say, oh, here's a feature. Here's what the feature does. But if you look at the designs, Maybe the color was different from what it said it should be, or maybe, you know, it didn't do things exactly, or it was coded in a way that the specifications and the coding didn't line up. So what you actually experienced based on what it said it should do wasn't right. Um, major, major problems that took a very long time to fix. And unfortunately, the the QA manager and the product manager had to work with the who, the guy who became the CTO as well as the developers and the testers to fix all of it. I mean, we spent probably six months at least just going through every screen and every feature, making sure that the documentation aligned with what was coded and what was designed and making them all mesh together. It took forever. And she was basically thrown into it. And I tried so hard to make it as good as possible for her when she arrived. But wow, I'm never going to let that happen Those again. Those are some good lessons. I hope. I hope. And if I do let it happen again, hopefully there's more money to be able to pay someone more money to deal with the BS that they have to deal with. You were saying that there's something that prevents people from going from four to five. What is that? I think it's learning to manage through people. So by the time you get to, to 5 million, you have, typically you'll have your executive team and, uh, and it's pretty easy to, to manage direct reports, but then you probably have a second layer, depending on the, the type of company, you may even have a third layer. And so the, the further removed you are from, uh, you know, the, 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 the people actually doing the work, the, the more difficult it is to manage and to keep that, that, that corporate DNA, to keep that culture intact. And so, yeah, I think that's one of the big challenges, learning to manage through people, not just manage people directly. And for a lot of founders, they, they don't have a lot of management experience. Uh, a lot of the SaaS founders we work with, they come from backgrounds that are, are development. So they've been technical. They haven't been, maybe they were team leaders, uh, but leading a company is, is a different experience for them. They could be finance people. They could be marketing people, sales, lots of different backgrounds. So it's a, just a different skill set to learn to, to not only manage direct reports, but how do you manage through the team? How do you make sure that that vision translates and gets all the way down? And it gets increasingly harder as the company gets bigger because you get further and further away. And so how do you, how do you make sure that everybody is, is engaged and really catches the vision as you're putting it out there? So how do you do that? How do you learn to manage through people? Part of it, I think, is, is in culture. And, and really being very specific, being very intentional about building culture from the beginning. So, I mean, I look at it, and the first thing I'll do is I'll hire for fit uh, before I hire for skill. Skills can be taught. And, and even the most skilled person can come in and they probably still only know, you know, 50, 60, 70%. 
of what they need to know, but that fit is one of the most important things. So they buy into the mission, the vision, the purpose, the core values of the company. But in order for them to do that, they need to know what they are and you, know, you have to have defined it. And so I think that's really an early step to do in a company is to do that. But it doesn't start with mission or vision. It actually starts the opposite of that. People talk about mission and backing into core values, but it starts the opposite. It starts with your core values. And that really leads to your vision and leads to your mission and your, your purpose. And so really starting with that. And so you're hiring people that are in alignment with those core values of your organization and that also have the right skills. So putting the, the right people in the right places. And so I think that's the, the beginning parts of it. And then staying close to them. So, you know, doing regular, regular meetings, doing things that are, are group oriented. Uh, and the same thing is true even uh, with your clients. The, the, the bigger you get as an organization, it's very easy as a leader to be far removed from that client experience. So I think it's super important to make sure that you stay engaged uh, with the clients, that you stay you know, very close to them in that process and spend time. And one of the most valuable things you can do as a CEO is spend time with clients, really understand you know, what it is that they're going through so you don't lose touch. Uh, because you're building a tech empire, building you know the the next greatest solution, and and it's easy to get into that that bubble of of doing lots of cool things or doing lots of things you think need to be done for the organization, and losing touch with that end client. In terms of hiring for fit, how do you suggest a company does that? And I'll I'll tell you real fast how I tried to do that. So. I would be the first person, or I am the first person that someone would talk to, right? So if we put out a job ad and someone actually clicks on the link and, and applies rather than just hitting the apply button on LinkedIn and ignoring our, our instructions, but if they, if they, they actually pay attention and, and pass, um, I'm the first person that they would have uh, an email with. And I would then invite them to click on the link to schedule a time in my calendar. If they said, I'm available at this time, instant fail, because that's not the instructions. The instructions are pick a time for my calendar. If they actually do that correctly, they'll get 30 minute call with me by video. And I'll go over why I built the company, what we're looking for in someone and, and just kind of get a fit for who they are. And then if I like them, then I'll pass them on to the hiring manager who will then start performing this, the hard skills test. Now, I had a conversation with someone, and, and there's a little bit more to that as well uh, from there, but obviously the, I think the first part is the most important. And the reason I do that is because I feel like if they pass a skills test, fantastic, but if they don't pass a, but if they pass a skills test and then not the culture test, I've wasted the team's time. If they, if they pass my culture test, but then fail the hard skills test, no harm, no foul. So I feel like my time is less valuable than the team's time, and I'd rather protect them by only introducing them people that I think are going to fit, but then letting them tell me who actually has the skills to do it. Now, I had a conversation recently with a guy who's running a multi-million dollar business, and he said that he does things opposite. He has the team do everything first, and then if they pass all of that, then they get the ability to talk to him, and he's the last person they talk to because he sees his time as the most valuable. What do you think? Yeah, I've seen it work both ways. Yeah, the, the most important piece, we spend a lot of time thinking about like you know, customer journey and mapping that out and trying to create that experience. I think the most important thing is making sure that you have that same experience for your team or your for, you know, future potential team and your candidates, that you've thought about what does that journey look like? How do we get them through the process in a way that, that feels really good to them? That, uh, that gives us the information that, that we need to make a decision, but especially in today's environment, that gives them the information they need to make a decision. Is this gonna be a good, a good place for them where they're gonna thrive and do really, really well and, and give them the ability to, to not do that? Yeah, there was a, a story, um, I assume it's true, um, with uh, I think it was Zappos, that uh, they would do the interview process and actually give people an opportunity uh, before they hired you know, we'll give you $1,500 right now to walk away and get drop out of this process right now. And, uh, but it saved them a ton because 
it, it prevented somebody from, from just job hopping or just, you know, that, that wasn't going to stick around any way that wasn't really bought into what they were doing. The culture really wanted to be a part of that company. I thought, now that's really interesting to, to think about that, but it's really creating that experience um, that allows somebody to, to say, yes, this is a fit for me. This is where I want to be long term. And I really see myself as, as contributing here and I, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. And that's really what I think we're looking for. So it doesn't necessarily matter if you start uh, at the top or you start somewhere else down the line. At some point, the company gets too big and uh, the CEO can't interview every single person. And so, you know, what does that look like as the company continues to scale? I think it's something that evolves. But I've seen it work well both ways where, you know, the, the, the top person is one of the first contacts and I've seen it work well uh, where they are, you know, one of the, the last contacts. And then the company grows to a place where that goes down a level and maybe it's the, the VP or the department head that becomes that first or last contact. Yeah, my thinking was I would probably do that to the first hundred and then after that, like revisit it. It depends on, on how many people you're hiring and how fast as well. So, you know, if you're, if you're growing quickly and you're, you're hiring, you know, 20 people a week, well, you may have to interview 100 people to do that. It, it becomes unscalable pretty quickly. Right. No, I mean, I'm doing a VC-funded startup. So, you know, there might be like, okay, in the next 18 months, we're going to hire 50 people, 100 people. That may be feasible. But at some point, it's really, you know, balancing, uh, you know, your time. And is that the most valuable use of your time as a leader? And uh, for some companies, some positions... Absolutely, it would be. Uh, for every position in the organization, probably not. I just know that of all the people, I'm the one that is able to best express the culture and what we're doing and why. Because I, I left other people that were running the hiring process to do that. And I just didn't get the same kind of excitement from the people we hired when I left that, when I took myself out of that process. So I felt like it was really important for me to put myself back in it. And I felt like it was a very important part of my job. I've experienced that as well. And, uh, and when that's happened, it's, it's really been because I have not passed on the DNA well enough to the, the leadership team or to, to whoever it is that's making those decisions. Uh, so much so that they would make the same decision that I would make in the, the same situation. What is the next level before... 10 million and how do you get there from four or five typically it is around seven seven to eight is kind of the next what i call revenue ceiling it just you know companies will get up around that range and then they just kind of hover there and it takes you know some big event uh, you know to get them over the hump uh, to get to 10. what's uh, an example of a hump said this you know back at uh, one to two a lot of times it's it's leadership and so in order to to continue growth, you know, a company will rarely outgrow its leader. And, and that includes the, the leadership team as well. And so the, the, the person that you hire, the level of person that you hire to get you from one to two is probably not the same level of person you need to get to seven to 10 or 10 to 20 or, or beyond. And so, yeah, as a leader continuing to, to grow your skills, uh, doing the same things, following the same processes, doing just mo doing more of what you have been doing to get from two to five, uh, or maybe even five to seven, is not going to get you uh, to ten. And so it is a, a fundamental shift, I think, in the the leadership, uh, in the mindset, and continuing to grow, and and really focus in. So it's a function of where you're spending your time. So you'll spend your time very differently running a one million dollar company than you do. Uh, seven or $10 million company. Um, but it, it takes personal growth to do that. It takes growth, you know, as a, a business, um, just business acumen, just a business leadership growth to, to what I call fill the chair. And so, like I said, a company will rarely outgrow its leader. And so what happens is they get stuck at that point. And again, it, uh, it takes a, a shift in the, the person. And that could be a leadership team change. It could be you know, expanding capabilities. And so now the people that you had, this is one of the, the challenges with giving people like titles uh, well over their qualifications is as the company continues to grow, now what do you do? Do you take that person, you say, okay, I know you've been a chief revenue officer, but now you're going to be VP of sales or, or something else. 
because we need a real chief revenue officer at, at this stage to get to, to 20 from where we are here. So that, that can become some really sticky conversations. And a lot of times, I mean, sometimes it is, you know, replacing somebody that just doesn't have the, the, the scale, you know, they, they can't scale, you know, to, to 10 or to 20 or wherever it is that you want to go next. So I think, you know, those are some, some real interesting things, uh, challenges. Uh, as leaders, we have to think about of, you know, what is holding back growth to get us from here to that next level? Is it bringing somebody in? Uh, you know, do I need to change how I'm doing things, how I'm leading? Uh, do we need you know, different leadership in a particular area, whether that be sales or marketing or HR or operations? You know, where, where are the constraints? How do you make the decision that, you know, it's one or the other, whether it's a person needs the opportunity to grow and, and how do you help them do that? Or we need to replace the person because it's going to take too long for them to get there. It's kind of a matrix. So there are people who you know, can and have the ability, and then there are people who will. And so if they can and they will, that's somebody that you really invest into and help them get there. Uh, if they can and they won't, uh, there are lots of people with, with potential, and, and they just don't want to. They don't want to, to do any more. They don't really want to grow. They're just happy where they are. And that's somebody that, you know, sad as it is, they're probably not going to be a fit with the organization going forward. There are people uh, who, who don't have the ability, uh, but absolutely have the will to do it. And I think you can get those, those people training and coaching and, and you know, maybe get them to that point. And then, of course, there are the ones that, that can't do it and, and don't want to do it. And those shouldn't be part of the organization to start with anyway. So I think there's, there's a couple of different scenarios where there's a path forward. And, uh, and one where there, there may not be if somebody's just really comfortable where they are and they don't have a growth mindset, and you're a, a high-growth company, then there's a mismatch there, and it's time for them to, to move on and get somebody in there that, uh, that, that will really fit into that, the, the growth mindset in the high-growth company, and give that person that's comfortable the ability to go be comfortable somewhere else, because there's probably a role out there that would be a good fit for them. How does a founder become self-aware that they're not the right person to continue running the company anymore? Well, like I said earlier, you know, we all have blind spots and, uh, and myself as well. And so I think we have um, you know, advisors and that could be a board of directors. It could be uh, a CEO peer group. And that's one of the things that we do with Champion Leadership Group is uh, have a very strong peer aspect to the, the group uh, where you have kind of an informal board of advisors. Uh, we've got uh, mentors, things like that. And so I think that's part of it. And, and again, you know, is it something that you know, there's nothing wrong as a founder with saying, hey, I grew it this far and, uh, and I'm done. I don't want to go any further. And so, again, is it a can do? Is it a want to? And so sometimes they can and they, they will or they want to. And, and that's something that can be trained. It's something that you get the right, the right coaching, the right support. You can get there uh, because you have the will. Uh, but there are certainly times where it's like, you know, I, I've built this this far. I'm tired. I want out. And, and there's nothing wrong with that either. You know, maybe it's not something that's that's life giving anymore. It's something that uh, you know has kind of become. I've, I've been in that place where I've been successfully stuck. You know, built something and now I'm trapped in my own hamster wheel, and uh, I don't like this anymore. I want out. So it's it's you know, what do you want to do as a founder? And so I think some of that is, is really just having honest conversations. You know, the willingness to be honest with yourself. Is this something that I really want to do, and do I have the capability to to take it to the next level? Uh, and if I don't, how can I get that? How can I develop that in myself? And, and if I don't want to, well, then who's the right person to take the reins? You know, is it hiring somebody from the outside? Is it, is it a sale? Is it an equity partner? Is it somebody from the inside that we can promote that, uh, that may be a really good fit for that? And so that's the, always having a succession plan, I think, is something that, that every company should do. Let's assume you can reach that seven, eight million per year. What is the last thing, I mean, obviously not last, but like what's the thing you need to do that'll allow you to get to 10 or, or break beyond 10 million per year? No matter what the revenue is, it's always about sales. And so it is sell. And, and there's, you know, early on, a lot of times, particularly in technical companies, it's, uh, it's all about the product. Um, but it, it's never really about the product. It's about, can we sell the product? Do we have something that is going to be revenue generating 
And so I think at that point, it is really focusing in hard, uh, you know, even more so double down on, on sales, on partnerships, on revenue generation. And then you get to, to 10, I mean, that is really you know, escape velocity. Um, th- there's not a lot that will kill a $10 million company. There, there's certainly things that can. Uh, but a mistake that you make at 10 uh, is not going to be completely detrimental to a company. Where if you make that same mistake at one, the company's dead. And, and I think every company that, that gets to 10, um, you know, I, I, I think entrepreneurs have uh, more lives than a cat. If cats have nine, entrepreneurs have, I don't know, 10 or 20. But every company that gets to 10 million has almost died 10 times. Uh, because the, the journey is never just up and to the right. It's always you know, up and down and up and down and up and down. And, and you, you want more of those ups than downs. But it is, you know, it is a, a challenge. But the things that, will, uh, that you can do at $10 million that you can't do below that, it really opens up a lot more opportunities. So if you grow a company to one, uh, the next million is, is inevitable. And I think the same thing is true. You get to 10, and uh, the, the next 10 is inevitable because it, it becomes, uh, you get that, that flywheel going, and, uh, and you're, you're continuing to, to grow and grow and grow. So you've heard it here. From 1 to 10 million, I'm sure there's a lot more he knows about that that we don't have time to go into detail. Uh, maybe there's another episode where we can go more into detail, but unfortunately there's no time left now. But is there anything that we haven't talked about that you'd like to add? Sure. If you want some specific growth tips, you want to go deep, uh, grab a, a copy of my book, Small Fish, Big Pond building a world-class business that swims circles around competitors. And it's got a lot of interactive content as well to help you grow and scale your business and, and get you from where you are today to the, the next million, the next five, the next 10, wherever it is that you want to go. So it's not about just hitting a magic number. There's nothing magic about 10. Uh, it's about growing to a business that supports you, that, gets to, that meets your vision and, and accomplishes what you want to accomplish. And maybe that's five, maybe it's one, maybe it's 100. But whatever that number is, uh, it's, it's designed to, to help you to do that and to, to move those roadblocks out of the way and blow through those revenue ceilings. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and your energy, Jeff. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if your goal is to get a company going above $10 million per year, just know that it's probably going to take a while And it's probably going to make you lose a lot of hair. But in the process, hopefully you find something that makes you smile every day and makes the journey worthwhile.